Good morning once again, everyone. Uh, this is the second of four NIMJIC GeoSeminar talks. It's good to see you all again. Uh, my name is Scott. I'm the NIMJIC president this year. Thanks to my fellow board members for uh, helping to organize these talks. And I'm really glad we all get to ha uh, have a chance to get together and, and learn about um, what everyone else is up to. NIMJIC membership. Um, and thanks, Zach, for coming to talk to us today. Really appreciate it. I don't have any announcements today. Um, don't forget to vote in the NIMJIC elections if you haven't already. Uh, you should have a link to cast your vote in your email. Um, there's five open board positions and a bunch of great candidates. So I'm sure you vote for the end of the day tomorrow, I think is the deadline. Um, we'll be recording today's talk for those that can attend, and we can post the video link to the NIMJIC website uh, in a few days. If you missed Stephen Hewitt's talk last week, uh, the recording is posted on our NIMJIC website, so uh, go ahead and go check it out. If you need any CE credits uh, for today's talk, um, I think we've done that in the past, so just shoot me an email or anybody else on the board and we can better figure that out for you. Um, please keep your questions until after the talk. You can use the raise hand button here on Zoom and we'll call on you or you can type in your questions into the chat window and we'll read them out for you. Uh, please try to keep yourself muted during the talk. And after the questions, we will leave the meeting open for a while, an open discussion about anything uh, y'all wanna talk about. And you're welcome to participate in that too. So let's get right to it. Um, today's speaker is Zach Edwards. Zach has over 15 years experience as a GIS professional. With six years of this being in field data collection solution sales. He has a solid understanding of data collection workflows and techniques, a deep knowledge of geographic theory gained through work experience, professional internships, and coursework. Coming, at, coming up with the right solution and streamlining workflows is something that he is passionate about. More specifically, coming up with solutions to challenging data collection efforts and the integration of these data in the office piques his interest. And today, Zach's going to be talking about the latest in GNSS field data collection, including Trimble and Esri software solutions that are available now. So, Zach, I'll let you take over now. And Thanks for coming. Yep, thank in. Yeah, thanks, Scott. I appreciate it. I'm going to keep my video off uh, for the sake of bandwidth. I've got kiddos here that are taking up some of my bandwidth, as you guys probably can relate to. And I'm sure you're all excited for yet another Zoom meeting. So uh, with that, let me go ahead and share my screen. And just confirm, Scott, if you will, if you can see my screen. Yep, it looks good here. Perfect. Alrighty, so <clears throat> we're going to talk about kind of the latest in the GPS GNSS data collection world um, as it relates to Trimble and Esri and a little bit more beyond that, but I'm going to try to keep it to the point and very interesting. Um, I think that uh, people are really going to like this and, um, you know, it's going to cover the gamut of, of, of different solutions here. So here's an overview. Um, the first thing we want to talk about is what to look for in a data collection solution. Um, and then, of course, uh, TerraFlex, uh, which is our flagship app um, as a dealer, um, which works on Android, iOS, Windows, Windows Mobile. And then Trimble Positions Desktop, which I still feel like a lot of folks aren't necessarily familiar with or know about, but it's a tool for beginning and ending your data in ArcMap, pre-post field for uh, TerraFlex, TerraSync, and even old school ArcPad workflows. So we're gonna go over that as well. Um, one of my favorite softwares, probably my favorite field software, if I really had to break it down uh, spec for spec, would be this PenMap field software, but it, it is only for Android and Windows. Um, I just put Android here because 90% of people aren't collecting data in the field with a Windows platform. Um, and then of course, ArcGIS Collector, what used to be called Collector, now it's ArcGIS Collector. 
And then of course, survey one, two, three. And I think a lot of folks on here have taken some courses, had some presentations done from Esri or, or some GIS consultants. We're just gonna kind of run through on the Esri side, kind of the latest news, what's happening and uh, kind of where and when I would use those particular software uh, workflows. Um, the latest, which is Esri's field maps, um, this is actually in holistic beta testing today. I think it actually begun, began yesterday uh, with Jeff Shaner's team at Esri. And so I'm assuming there's quite a few folks that are actually doing that today that might be missing this presentation. So um, we'll kind of talk about that as well. An overview of correction services for GPS or GNSS. Uh, we're gonna be covering that briefly. And then a brief overview of kind of the latest hardware, which I think most people are familiar with, but we'll breeze through those very quickly. So what are we going to look for in a data collection solution, being the hardware and the software? What, what are the things that we want to look for? Well, of course, simple and easy to use is kind of the, the biggest thing these days. And, and Esri has made that evident with Collector um, and Survey123 for that matter. So simple and easy are definitely uh, what we're looking for. And integration, right? how does your workflow, software and hardware integrate with other platforms, whether it's the cloud or whether it's a disconnected um, solution? Um, basically how well the GNSS performs without cellular. So how can we tackle areas where we're not gonna be doing real time over cellular? And then, of course, the, the standard Trimble motto ruggedness, which your IP rating, uh, what's the drop rating, can it be submerged or splashed, or is it dust proof, et cetera. Um, price is definitely a big factor. Um, camera specs, uh, definitely increasingly becoming a big factor. Most newer devices have pretty solid specs on cameras, but uh, we'll go over that briefly. And of course, comms, you know, Wi-Fi and 4G and I guess soon to be 5G. And then what's your return on investment for the solution as a whole? Another huge uh, piece of the puzzle. So we're gonna jump right into Terraflex. And uh, Scott, just let me know if for some reason I'm breaking up or there's any connection issues. And if there is, I'm gonna have to switch to my hotspot. So far, so good. Good deal. So here, um, a lot of folks are probably familiar with Terraflex. It's been around for, gosh, I think almost seven years at this point, but probably only truly uh, gained some big traction in the last three to four years. And it's because they're constantly improving it and it's becoming a solid solution. Bugs have been worked out. It works on a lot of platforms. So some of this language here is, is from Trimble and some of its stuff that I put together. Um, it is fast and efficient. Um, it does work on a fleet. It's very uh, ideal for a fleet. Um, and then of course, uh, organizing data. It does a very good job of that, similar to a uh, collector. And of course you can work in a disconnected environment where you do not have cellular and uh, just continue to collect data and then sync when you're back in a, a Wi-Fi or a cellular environment. Um, there's two additions. Uh, most people get advanced. Basically, the only difference is um, data update workflows cannot be done in basic. So if you're trying to um, update existing data in the field and import data to navigate to it or to create a to-do or a task, that is where the advance would come into play. So again, disconnected editing works on all these platforms. Um, and these are some of the devices that we deal in. Um, you see the iPhone, um, our T10 Windows tablet, our Nomad 5 on Android, the classic Geo 7 on Windows Mobile, and then of course the TDC 150 on Android version 6. Um, the really cool thing about Terraflex and where it's come is that you can integrate with ArcMap via uh, either the Terraflex add-in plugin or Trimble positions. And we'll go over kind of the differences of those and, and why that's important um, on a, a later slide. 
So <clears throat> with TerraFlex, you can differentially correct or post-process your data with Trimble positions. Um, currently, there's no software package that I know that can do that uh, with an app. So collector, you cannot post-process data. So if you do not have a real-time correction in the field and you're shooting for uh, better than a couple of feet, um, it's probably not going to happen without some sort of service, um, uh, correction service of, of some sort in the field. Now, I don't know what the future holds uh, with that, but I would guess that that's probably going to be the case uh, for years to come. Um, another cool thing, I can't talk too much about it. I even asked Trimble about this. And, um, you know, basically, all I can say is that there's a release of TerraFlex coming soon that's going to have a lot more improvements than previous releases. And, and some of that has to do with uh, projected coordinate systems or uh, modern coordinate systems, not just geographic lat long WGS84. So the desktop add-in, so this is just kind of a screenshot from Trimble's marketing page showing a little bit about what that looks like. Um, it's free. If you have TerraFlex, it just uses your named user login. So whether you have the basic version or the advanced, uh, you can install this add-in for free and you can start your data, uh, your project off from a um, file or SDE geodatabase. And so that way your schema is based on um, your GIS. You're not having to create forms or data dictionary files or feature code libraries or whatever the other terms are in other manufacturers workflows. You're not having to do that because everything stems from your uh, geodatabase domains and attributes. Um, and similar to Trimble positions, um, it's similar. It's basically everything but the ability to differentially correct or post-process your data. So again, sorry, let me step back here. So the, the reason why you might want this, if you're running TerraFlex first and foremost, you, you might want this, is if you're an Esri user, if you're not wanting to have everything begin and end on a tab in a browser, you want everything to begin and end in ArcMap. And there is talks about support for Pro, because I know that's gonna be a question. Um, I would say, it's going to be a year before you're going to see anything available in Pro because they'll have to completely reprogram both the add-in for the TerraFlex add-in and the Trimble Positions desktop add-in. So I'd say that we're at least a year out on that one, but uh, it'll be supported in ArcMap in perpetuity until ArcMap is no longer supported, let's just say. So Trimble Positions. So this this software has been out for quite a while, but again, has been recently gaining a lot of traction because it just works really well. It works a lot better than when it was first released. Um, again, it's for ArcMap and allows you to build these projects for either TerraSync, TerraFlex, and ArcPad. Um, I'm going to focus on TerraFlex because that's the most common way to use it. And then TerraSync and then ArcPad is probably the least common way to use it, but you can, you can use it in all three of these scenarios. So it's designed to be a replacement for uh, GPS Pathfinder Office users if you're an Esri user. We do have a lot of customers that, that um, simply use AutoCAD. Now, not so much in the GIS realm, but that's still a reality for a lot of folks. So it allows you to use your Connect login um, through ArcMap uh, to create projects um, and to sync data. And again, post-processing and reconciling of, of these data are fairly new. Um, I would say six to eight months ago, you couldn't do this. And one really cool thing for legacy users, if you're a TerraSync user and you have existing data dictionary files or DDFs that have been built with um, the data dictionary editor in Pathfinder Office, you can convert data seamlessly between a DDF to a geodatabase or from a geodatabase to a DDF. So it's kind of nice if you have uh, a lot of data dictionary files that have been built and you don't want to start from scratch with your geodatabase creation. So it's, it's a very nice tool for conversion there. 
this is kind of Trimble's uh, uh, kind of workflow for Terraflex, where you've got the, the field app here to the left. You've got an integration with their, their cloud and you sync through a geodatabase and you create projects and templates through a geodatabase as well as uh, tasks and things just kind of follow this workflow. They follow this flow in and out of the geodatabase, in and out of the cloud, in and out of the app. Um, this is the workflow for TerraSync. Um, this is another uh, workflow that I really enjoy as well because I'm a big fan of TerraSync still. Um, you can start in a geodatabase, create your DDF file from your uh, geodatabase schema and domains and send that out to TerraSync. You can also send out a, a, a SSF file, meaning that if you wanted to send background data or existing data out to the field for reference. So if I wanted to send some wetlands or some trees or you know property corners, whatever it may be, um, for reference, I can send that data out of my feature class within ArcMap through the tool, uh, through the Trimble Positions add-in as an SSF to be opened in TerraSync. And it could be opened as an active file for data collection and data update, or it can be opened as a background only file. And then of course, once the data has been collected, um, you're checking the data in into ArcMap and you're post-processing through the toolbar which is then reconciling your corrected data into the geodatabase. And then lastly, um, the ArcPad workflow, uh, which I guess will still be supported as long as ArcPad is supported. I think it's been officially discontinued, but I do know some people that are still running this and um, it still works. So this is that particular workflow. Okay, PenMap. So this is another um, app for data collection. This is um, considered to be a hybrid for survey and GIS data collection. I'd say that's a pretty good representation of what it is. It currently only works on Android and, um, and, win and Windows. It's very good for creating projects on the fly. Um, you can't really create projects on the fly with with um, Terraflex. The, they have to have been built either with Trimble Positions or the Terraflex add-in in an arc map or through the web interface. There's no way to just say, hey, I've got to start working. I just got to get out there and collect data and I don't have time to pre-build something in the office. I just want to get to work. So that is a very, very popular uh, workflow uh, for that particular thing in mind is that you can do on the fly coll collection. And I think if, I believe that the same is true for um, survey one, two, three and collector, that there's no real way to um, just start collecting on the fly. You would have to have built that um, uh, before the field. Uh, what it does that a lot of softwares don't do um, is staking, um, field staking. And, and staking is not necessarily something only for a surveyor, right? I mean, you might need to just navigate accurately to something in the field um, with a staking routine or with uh, a little bit more information than a typical navigate function. Um, with that being said, it does allow for navigation and then also completely disconnected editing as well. Um, another thing that it can do that's probably more familiar to a, a land surveyor would be a site calibration and also top-notch coordinate system support. And what I mean by that is all of the coordinate systems that you can imagine are available through PenMap. And if you select it at the beginning of your project creation on the handheld or um, on your Windows machine, um, it will download uh, the coordinate system if it doesn't already have it. So let's say you're wanting to load a particular geoid for a particular vertical value uh, that you're after and you don't have it, it'll allow you to download that in the field if you've got internet connection. <clears throat> um, well, a downside to this, it doesn't support differential correction. So you have to accept your field accuracy. So if you're using an accurate receiver and you have an accurate correction source, <clears throat> this is an ideal workflow. If you're okay with a couple, two, three feet, then in many times you can just use a, a free SBAS or WAS correction source. 
again, Android and Windows only. Um, the project manager, this is just the, I guess, so to speak, the office side. So you could uh, build your projects here or you can build them on the field device. You can do either or. Um, there's a general tab that um, you give it a name, a description, and a template that you may have pre-built, which includes certain types of points, lines, or polygons with certain types of attributes. Um, the coordinate system that you're working within, the, the horizontal datum and the, and the geoid model that you may want. Um, and then, of course, um, there's a data tab for um, basically showing you any data that you uploaded that you might want to stake to or navigate to. Uh, or data that you've exported that you might want to download and bring into CAD or GIS or uh, Google Earth or what have you. <clears throat> and then lastly, there's a users tab. If you've got multiple users, you can kind of assign people to projects. So that's another uh, cool functionality of this if you've got more than one user. Um, so collector. Um, I think a lot of people here know what collector is. It's been around for a long time. Um, so we're going to go through these slides and talk about kind of the pros and cons and what's going on with Collector. Obviously, ease of use and efficiency is, is a big one. Um, I would say that it's slightly easier to use than, than Terraflex. Um, definitely a little bit easier to use than, than PenMap, um, but doesn't have a lot of the same functionality or, or same capabilities. So... Um, I'm assuming most of you know this, but obviously you need a level two or creator named user. I think there's also a field worker user that uh, you can use for this as well. Um, every time I think I'm proficient, by the way, in, in ESRI licensing, uh, I realize how ignorant I am because things are ever changing and, and their naming and nomenclature changes. And so it's hard to sometimes keep up with this stuff. So if I'm wrong on this, uh, correct me at the end. Um, and then, of course, there's credit usage with these users. Um, it is pretty minimal. I've been on large data collection pushes with Collector where we were collecting a boatload of data and pictures and we were only using six to eight credits a day. So don't let the credit usage scare you with Esri. It's, I think you can buy a thousand credits for a hundred bucks if you are not running server and you're running ArcGIS online. Um, so the credit usage is very minimal when you're talking about data collection. It just gets bigger when you get up into the geoprocessing. Um, Two-way connection is huge. So this is definitely something that Esri has got right um, that I hope someday Trimble will do for Terraflex is that it's truly two-way. So if person A collects data on their login and person B is simultaneously on, in the field in their login and in the same area, if you refresh, it's near real time two way. So person A will see person B's data in near real time. With uh, the Trimble app workflows currently, it doesn't work that way. You would have to sync both users' data and then re push that data back out. So that is definitely something that, if it's important to you, um, there's a big leg up for, for Collector in that regard. Um, it works with all of our popular handhelds the 100, 600, and, and 150. And then of course, there's a SDK that Esri, <coughs> excuse me, Esri and Trimble work together on for implementing uh, Bluetooth receivers properly and accurately into um, Collector. And um, the middleware um, is actually Trimble Mobile Manager. So this is one of the, I think, key takeaways of this, this uh, presentation, if you're a collector user, you do not use GNSS status anymore. That's, that's a thing of the past. It's still available in the, the, the app store, but for collector, you do not use GNSS status anymore. It will still work, but the recommended middleware is Trimble Mobile Manager, and it is definitely more efficient, and it doesn't require you to have two apps open simultaneously. Okay, so what's new and what's to come with Collector? Um, again, some of this may be old hat for you, but uh, we're going to run through it for those that aren't aware. Um, so this has been around for a while, I think about four or five months, if not a little longer, but they've incorporated averaging because they know they're interfacing with, with receivers that are um, 
needing a little bit higher accuracy and the averaging is helping out with that. <clears throat> Here's another screenshot of what it looks like. I'm pretty sure most people here have seen this. And then they added a 95% confidence, um, which is for the real data collection nerds out there for your root mean square error, but they've added that uh, support in there. Now for the bad news here, um, well, this isn't necessarily bad news, but the Collector Classic was officially deprecated in June 2020. Um, and now you've just got ArcGIS Collector as your, your main application. And that will be deprecated and replaced by Esri's field maps, which we're gonna talk about next. Um, and I think some of you may be aware of this, some of you may not, but I'm not sure on the timeline, I would just say that I would be pretty confident in saying that in one year from now, you will not be able to use ArcGIS Collector anymore. Um, meaning you can't get it from the Google Play or the Apple Store. Um, I don't know officially what the dates are gonna be yet, but we should know pretty soon. Now, Survey123, um, another very popular Esri software here that's form-centric, um, allows for point data collection only. So if you need lines or areas, that's immediately out. Um, definitely very simple to build out. And then of course it still uses the Esri named users and credits like collector. It does work with um, our flagship handhelds and our, uh, our, our one R2 catalyst receiver. Now this is another important piece because I think some of you might be aware of a connection issue where there was an update to survey one, two, three that broke the ability to use the Trimble R1 receiver um, with uh, survey one, two, three, and it was a known issue. There was a lot of um, hype on it. And finally, I think it was about three months ago that they fixed that. And um, I even tested this yesterday and I can seamlessly connect um, either my R1 or R2 or catalyst receiver to um, the survey one, two, three app uh, using the Trimble mobile manager that I mentioned. So again, it requires the middleware uh, which again is no longer GNSS status. Um, you can, and this is the case also for Android and iOS. Um, so here's the difference if you're an Android versus an iOS user. If you're an Android user, it actually uh, currently overrides the internal location or location services of the handheld. Um, with iOS, um, at least with survey one, two, three, it seems to work a bit better. You actually just select the R1 itself, um, still using the mobile manager app to initially configure the R1, but then subsequent times you open the app, survey one, two, three, you will not need to uh, open Trimble mobile manager. It just automatically happens. The same goes for collector. Okay, so field maps. I don't have a ton on this because it is relatively new and I've only recently been playing with it myself. Uh, but here's kind of the, the takeaway that I'm gathering from Esri's resources and my experience is that they're formally bringing together collector, explorer, navigator, tracker, and workforce into one application. So when you think of it that way, you kind of understand this push to field maps so that you don't have five apps for something that really can be rolled into one. So that's, that's what's going on here. Right now it's in beta phase one. And like I mentioned, there's a, a holistic testing going on uh, as of yesterday and today. So, I mean, there might be some Nimjik folks uh, doing that as, as we speak. And then um, I'm sharing a link here. I can share these slides, but basically uh, this link just talks a little bit about field maps and how to be a beta tester if you would like. And basically you just need a, ArcGIS online or ArcGIS account uh, to test this out. And from my testing, um, it's pretty much identical to collector from the data collection aspect. I mean, I literally didn't know which app I had open when I tested. I said, do I have collector open? And then I just had to kill it and reopen it. Now there's some subtleties in how the attributes look once you collect a feature. But in the map view and the actual map settings and the, 
main collector piece looks almost identical to field maps. Logins the same, a lot of the settings are the same. Okay, so we're gonna bounce over to correction services. So again, this may be old hat to some people, but it's important to understand when we're talking about GPS or GNSS as a whole. So either you don't have a correction service and you might plan on post-processing, uh, you have satellite-based augmentation or what's called wide area augmentation system in North America, which is a, a free satellite-based correction that'll typically get you um, around a meter on a, on a device that's capable of it, sometimes a bit better. Um, there's the virtual VRS system or virtual reference station, um, which I'll show a little bit more in detail here shortly. And then Trimble RTX, which is a um, basically a real-time extended or real-time uh, correction source that's available through satellite, meaning no cellular or you can pull it in through IP or cellular and get the same correction feed. Okay, so let's take a look at um, our network. So Altera Central has a network of base stations that you can pay to be part of uh, for VRS. And I'm just showing this to you guys uh, because I don't think a lot of people know this. Um, so we have recently expanded our network to encompass these cities. And if you would have asked me, you know, where was this at six months ago, over half of these base stations weren't even up. Actually, three quarters of them weren't up. So this is a very recent phenomenon. And um, shameless plug here, but uh, we do have a promo on this. And the cool thing about this too, if you work in this area, even if you're not doing real-time correction over cellular, you can post-process off of our base stations and we're going to take a look at the, the NGS cores map to show you what's available out here that's free for the public and then show you and, and kind of uh, look at that against our base stations. You'll see that there's a lot more coverage. So there may be some value for you in picking up a subscription so that you could post process off of Loco Hills or off of Alamogordo. Um, I know there's a public one in Roswell and I believe there's a public one over in the Ruidoso area, but we'll take a look and, 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 and compare and contrast. But there's some value there beyond real-time corrections. You can also post-process. And of course, we're a Texas-based company, and so we've got base stations uh, in Texas, and we're also uh, the dealer for Oklahoma. Okay, so VRS, this is Trimble's coverage. So again, I'm just trying to show you this because I don't think a lot of people necessarily know that this exists or what the coverage coverage areas are. So Trimble does have a network um, in the Albuquerque metro area. Um, I think it actually reaches up to Santa Fe now, but um, if you pay into this, which if you were interested in, you can contact me. Uh, there is coverage in this area. Now RTX, so um, this is a global map showing the coverage. Um, basically it covers the majority of the populated world. Um, I'm going to skip down to this fast area to explain what that is because that's really important, but there's also a trial. So if you have a receiver that's capable of doing RTX, and that would either be, um, you know, the R1, the R2, uh, the Catalyst, um, the TDC 150, any of these things, you can do a 30-day trial, which before they, they only had a three-day trial. So in the last couple of months, they launched a a uh, 30 day trial where you can just test it out. And this does work on the Geo 7X, by the way, too, um, if you have a Geo 7, but it has to be over the internet. It, it doesn't, the Geo 7 doesn't have a satellite based, it doesn't have the ability to read the L5 band, which is the band that RTX is broadcasted on. So you would need cellular if you're going to use the Geo 7. So this is that fast coverage that I was talking about. So basically the entire continental US. Um, is able to get very quick initialization time with RTX on any of the receivers that I mentioned. Um, fast typically means uh, two minutes and you're down to the accuracy of the subscription. So um, definitely leaps and bounds ahead of where they were a year ago this time. 
Um, on to some hardware. Um, I think a lot of people already have seen all this, so I'm kind of going to breeze through this because, um, you know, you guys can Google this stuff and I'm sure you already know about almost everything I'm about to show here. So uh, this is still our flagship receiver. It's very popular. We have almost no negative feedback on it. The only thing that I would say that's not ideal is the battery life. Um, we typically see five to six hours, and with a lot of our other equipment, we're up to the eight or 10 hour mark. So, um, but you can swap that battery in for a charged one. So that's really the only negative that I would say with this particular receiver. Um, the TDC 150, um, capable of submeter down to centimeter, Android only, and it supports, these are the three marketed platforms, but it will also support, um, Survey123 and a couple other, uh, there's a lot of free apps that'll work on here as well. Again, this is an Android 6 only device. Unfortunately, it will not support the upcoming field maps application because that I believe requires Android 8 or later. Um, the TDC 600 is a very popular low cost handheld um, and that is, um, Android 8.1, so that will support the upcoming field maps software. Um, the Nomad 5, um, that is a very popular, highly rugged device um, that you can attach this module on for submeter data collection. So that's another um, device that I feel like a lot of people don't know a lot about. I feel like a lot of people don't know about the Nomad 5. So this is, it's a solid, extremely rugged device. And again, it runs Android. I believe it runs Android 8, so I believe it will work with field maps. I'll, I'll have to confirm that though. And then lastly, um, I wanted to give another um, shameless plug here of a, of a new product, relatively new product that we carry called the CT8 tablet by Juniper Systems. It's Android 8.1, and it's around a meter of accuracy, plus or minus. Um, uh, it's extremely, um, the specs are unbelievable for the price. So if you're interested in this, you know, reach out to me. Um, this is a very, very popular device with our receivers and even standalone when people don't need the level of accuracy. So now we're on to Q and A. So I guess we can open it up to the chat window, Scott, or um, just have people chime in over audio. Yeah, sounds good, Zach. That was great, thanks. Uh, any, any questions, anybody? And I know there's a lot that I covered, so you know, we can always refer back to these slides or people can take things offline with me, but I wanted to kind of show everything and every, anything and everything that I'm kind of dealing in, so. It, oh, here we go. Um, Shelby asks, the Jennifer tablet, is it able to uh, connect via Bluetooth to the R1? It absolutely is. It, it works very well in that case. We have a lot of people using it with the R2, um, and I don't have a lot of people using it with the R1. It's only because the R1 has been out longer, and I think people already have their devices that they've established with them. Um, but it's it's a grand, and it's Gorilla Glass, and it's got crazy good specs, and um, we have we've had no negative feedback. It's USB-C as well, so it charges quickly. Ten hour battery life can operate at 140 degrees. So you don't have to worry about the, the device um, overheating. And there's a follow-up with that. Um, what, what sort of accuracy would you see with the R1 paired? Oh, the R, so the R1 is sub-meter. Um, I have seen as good as 14, 15 inches on a survey control monument, but again, that kind of bounces. So I, I would say a foot and a half to two and a half feet with the R1 paired with any device that can support the R1. We've, we've, Trimble's pretty conservative with that. You know, they spec it at like 60 centimeters or something like that. Um, we typically see it a little bit better than that. So a little better than two feet. Cool. Uh, on that tablet, if you don't have a, an external antenna or receiver, what, what sort of accuracy so that's, I've been actually testing this with somebody. So Juniper claims, and actually you can see my screen still, right? Because I'd like to just go ahead and um, 
show this. I wanted to show a few links anyways. Can you still see that, Scott? I sure can. Did I stop sharing? No, you're still good. I can still see you here. But let me, let me turn off my video to see if, I don't know, maybe there's something going on with that. Just let me know if you can see my screen. Yeah, I can see your screen here. I, yeah, okay, I can so, see your screen. Okay, perfect. So um, not to beat this to death, but the, whoops, clicked on the wrong link here. So they claim, and again, I mean, every manufacturer has different tactics, right? They claim that it produces within one meter in open skies. Now, I can attest to the fact that I've tested this on survey control, and it's typically within three to five feet. So when they say it's accurate to within one meter in open skies, I would say that's not 100% of the time, but it's going to be very close to a meter and not much more than a meter. I'd say 80% of the time. Um, there is no external antenna set up for that device that I can, um, I'm actually looking at, oh, actually there is. I just have not ever seen anybody use that. So you could put a patch antenna on this device if you wanted to get it above your head. Um, but most people are just using this with a Bluetooth receiver or they're just using it internally and, you know, four or five feet is more than enough. And real quick, I know I'm bouncing around and I apologize, but I meant, I wanted to show you guys this course map. I, a lot of people have probably seen this, but these are the publicly available base stations that have been submitted to the NGS or NOAA. And so I just wanted to show you like how sparse it is up here. As far, like if you're collecting data anywhere in this area and you're trying to be, you know, within a decimeter, four inches or so, your baseline distances are going to be too far. And so that's a case where RTX or possibly even the Trimble VRS network in this area is going to give you better data. Now you'd have to pay for it, but um, you can still achieve the accuracy you want. And um, I actually collected some data. I'm on the Northwest side and this particular base station has been very spotty and I'll show you that tab. That doesn't look good. <laughs> So when your data availability looks like that, and I haven't had a chance to follow up with the operator of the space station, but that's not good news because that means anybody that collected data in these time frames is unlikely to be able to post-process the data. So the nearest base station for me, um, I wish I could get this thing to go away. There we go. Um, was P034, the Sandia base. Well, the distance from here to here is you know 35 kilometers you know so then my accuracy uh, is going to suffer you can see this is a nice clean set of data so the reason why i'm showing this is because there's other options besides the standard post-processing off of known public base stations especially if you're looking for data better than a foot uh, and your your hardware is capable of it so I, I just wanted to circle back to that so my bad and i will go back to questions For the Altera uh, Correction Service, do you guys have any plans? Do you know to expand up to northern New Mexico, perhaps? Um, so honestly, I don't run that team. That's a separate team. But I will say that I don't think we're going to see much more development beyond what I showed you um, for at least a year. And I think the reason for that is because, you know, we're contiguous with Texas, right? So they're, they're expanding it over into New Mexico. And there's also these other pay for networks, such as the Trimble network in, in the Albuquerque metro area. And I think extending up to Santa Fe, as well as there's an Arizona company that has a network that extends into Western New Mexico. So if you kind of look at all the different options, you know, most of New Mexico is covered in Doniana County, you have, um, you know, a free network there with the Doniana County Flood Commission. So the entire Doniana County is a free VRS network. So all of the populated areas are pretty much covered, um, except for possibly Farmington. Um, I'd have to look at some of the other organizations that sell subscriptions, but I'd be happy to refer anybody that's looking for something like that, even if we don't deal with it or sell it. 
Okay, awesome. Uh, we have a question from Lance Tyson. Uh, any recommended solutions that allow capturing tracks or breadcrumbs while also collecting features? Collector Classic did this, but he doesn't think that the newer collector does. I'll, I can get back to you on that, Lance. I will say that um, uh, breadcrumb support is, is available in Terraflex. Um, I don't think it was in the past because I don't remember seeing it. I could be wrong, but um, I just did it the other day. So they, they have bread, bread, breadcrumb support in Terraflex like they used to or like they still do for TerraSync. Um, I'll have to look into that for field maps. That's a very good question. I didn't see that, but I only tested it for about an hour. Okay, great. Uh, Marcel Brown asks, is there a fixed date set on Esri field maps rollout in early 2021? No, I, well, I shouldn't say no. I haven't seen it. So I, in all of the documentation I've seen pushed out by Jeff Shaner, the mobile development lead at Esri, it, it's indicating to me that there's gonna be some sort of release in October this month but I don't think it's a formal release aside from the beta. I think it's just phase two of beta. Um, I don't know when they're going to release the formal. I thought it was going to be before the end of the year, honestly, but I don't know that that's the case. And it, you can use it in beta right now, pretty much fully functional, at least from a data collection standpoint. But I, I don't know. I, I do have an email into Jeff to kind of ask some questions and we'll see what he comes back with. I was happy to see that they're kind of rolling in all these different products into one. Um, it makes it easier to keep track of things for my. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's definitely a bummer for, you know, people that are literally just getting into collector or have been using collector at the same time. I'm going to tell you guys this, and this is just kind of how I would approach things. We've sold some TDC one fifties to people and, you know, obviously it's frustrating because, field maps will not be supported on Android 6. So with the 150, the, the Android system can't be upgraded. So what I've kind of told people is, um, if you've invested in a TDC 150 and you're gonna use color, make sure that you download the, the APK file before they deprecate it, or whatever the latest version is, because you can load that on, even after Esri pulls the, uh, the app from the Google Play Store. Unfortunately, with iOS, I don't think there's any way to archive it just because of the way Apple's built. Um, but, and I even have an email into Jeff asking that specifically, like, where can I get this APK? What's the easiest safe link to download that from? Because that's gonna be a reality where people are gonna be in the middle of a project, you know, it's not gonna be supported and they've got a field user that needs to load it on a new piece of hardware and they don't have the luxury of going over to, to field maps necessarily. So um, stay tuned on that because I don't think Esri is just going to leave people high and dry. I think there's going to be a workaround. Yeah, that's definitely good advice. Um, back on Terraflex, I wanted to ask, uh, is, do you know a timeline on that new Terraflex release that you mentioned? I figured that was going to be a question. Um, of course, Trimble doesn't share things with me before they share them with the public. So I'm just going to say that it'll happen this year um, with high confidence. But, um, you know, things get pushed back, you know, with COVID and everything, uh, everything did get pushed back. So I will say that it should have already been released um, just because um, it should have. <laughs> so, but again, these things are out of their control in many ways and, and mine too. So I would say, I wouldn't expect anything before the, the very end of the year, um, maybe early 2021 at the latest. But the idea with that release is gonna be, you know, the importance of coordinate system support. Yeah, that was uh, an important thing for me. Personally, um, archeologists seem perpetually stuck in UTM NAT83 and uh, that's what we're all used to. So yes, looking and forward to that. Several archaeologists asking me for it and it's very I it's something that's a uh, long time coming I mean it's definitely a long time coming and, and I, I think you'll like what you see um, but I just think it's 
it's hard for me to speculate on the exact release date, but um, I'm hopeful that you'll see something before the end of the year, but can't promise you that. Awesome. Are there any other questions? Anybody else? I think that might be it, Zach. Yeah. Well, thank you everybody for your time and uh, appreciate it. Hopefully uh, there was at least a tidbit in here that was worthwhile to y'all. Yeah. Thank was, you. Thank you. Sure. Very okay. Much. <laughs> yeah. And please reach out to me if you have any additional questions or want to get together. I'm, I'm around. All right. Thank you guys. Thanks everyone. Uh, next week, make sure to turn, tune in. Um, Raul Campos Marchetti will talk about uh, drone technology and its applications at the Pueblo of Santa Ana. So that should be really interesting, I think. Um, so Absolutely. Hope to see you all there. Same same day, same time. Now more details. Right, uh, and then we'll announce the winners for the NIMJIC board next week. Right. Um, so please remember to vote, those of you that haven't. Yeah, good reminder. Uh, and I think we're announcing scholarship winners next week, possibly. So look forward to that too. Awesome. Well, thanks everyone. We'll Thank talk you. To you. Have a good day.